Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Museum After Hours. I'm Sarah Bell, the new director of the Kansas Museum of History, and it is my great pleasure to be joined tonight by the former director of the Kansas Museum of History and my good friend, Mary Madden. Mary Madden graduated from Bowling Green State University in Ohio before earning a master's degree in American Studies and Museum Studies from the University of Kansas. She recently retired as director of the Kansas Museum of History after working 40 years at the agency. Her presentation tonight will be 77,000 ways to move a museum. In the early 1980s, the Kansas Historical Society's Museum in Memorial Hall closed in preparation for the opening of exhibits in the new Kansas Museum of History. Staff duties included packing boxes, lifting a car out of Memorial Hall's roof, and moving a steam locomotive through the streets of Topeka, to name just a few. As registrar at the time, Mary Madden oversaw moving the artifacts from their downtown location to the western edge of the city. With the current closure of the museum for renovation, it is a good time to look back to see how it all began. Don't forget, you can use the Q&A button or the chat to ask questions. And after the presentation, we'll get to as many as we can. And now I'm going to just slide on over as Mary is here with us tonight and get your PowerPoint up for you, sure. Mary. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm glad, to, I hope I'm somewhere centered. Um, I'm glad to be here. Um, as uh, Sarah mentioned, um, I'm gonna be talking about the move from the Memorial Building downtown out to what we called, affectionately called the new museum, which is now you know, 40 years old. Um, at the time I was move coordinator, I was also registrar. And as registrar by default, I became MOVE coordinator. And I hope some people watching tonight uh, were part of this, um, oops, of, of this activity. And I'd love to hear uh, your comments, kind comments, please, at the end of the, of the program. Um, so the picture you're looking at now is the beginning of the Kansas State Historical Society at uh, the Capitol. So it was on, I think, the sixth or eighth floor, sixth floor of the Capitol, where it was started in 1875. And um, that was the staff. And I see some artifacts that we still have and probably will be on exhibit again soon. Um, so the, the Capitol, as the government got bigger, the division or agencies got bit bigger and needed more space. Um, they decided to build a special building for the museum. The building also uh, what is the largest Civil War memorial to um, that war. It is named the Memorial Building because it's a memorial to the Civil War. And it reminded me years ago when we started doing stuff about World War II, the 50th anniversary, a 50th anniversary of something major brings out that out in people. And so the Grand Army of the Republic wanted a building. They were the uh, survivors of, the Union survivors, and they wanted a building to hold their meetings. And the condition was that as they passed, that the entire building would be turned over as the State Historical Society's offices. And here we have a picture of President Taft, I think our biggest president, he did like to eat, laying the cornerstone in the center of the picture. Um, and there's another picture of him in the crowd. So you can see it was 1911, it was a big day in Topeka. Uh, 1914 is when the building was completed and they moved the collections, not as we would have, but, um, they had a much big ceremony. So these are the battle flags of Kansas, mainly the Civil War battle flags um, that were in the collection um, that were at the Capitol, also with the uh, Spanish-American War flags, because this was prior to World War I. Uh, as we learned, it rained a little bit that day, or was damp, and when they moved the flags into the Memorial Building, a lot of them they kept furled. 
And when we went a hundred years later or whatever to maybe years later to, to pack them, they were just shreds of silk because they had splintered. Um, so we started a campaign, not that day, but soon after to restore the battle flags uh, because these are artifacts that people actually fought and died under. So uh, when you see the battle flags in our collection now, they are very well preserved and it's a very important part of our collection. Um, so here are the movers. And in some ways, I think I have more in common with them than if I was moving the museum today. <laughs> Notice they don't have any computers either. Um, this was all pre-computers. So when they moved into the Memorial Building in 1914, um, it filled up rapidly as the GAR uh, read, uh, passed and uh, their, their spaces were uh, given over to the State Historical Society. And, and just for clarification, um, the State Historical Society is the official name of our agency, but it has many departments. And the museum, the Kansas Museum of History is one of them. And it's, it's always been confusing. So if you're confused, you're not alone. Um, but this is the newspaper collection in the building. And so over those 60, 70 years, we were collecting. Um, and this is the fourth floor before the ceiling was uh, the drop ceiling was put in. Um, and so it looks very different as, you know, it looks like an old fashioned museum. There's a saddle hanging from a beam up there. Uh, they weren't very discreet in what they collected, just whatever people brought in and um, they stored them. One of the icons of the <laughs> Memorial Building on the fourth floor were these lovely period rooms and, um, there were six, eight, there were, this is the sod house. There was a schoolhouse, there was a dentist's office. And one of the things I want to warn Sarah about was, is that when you open new exhibits, people remember the old ones. And we had a lot of complaints. Where are the period rooms? We love the period rooms. So I think the moral of the story is people want change, but they also don't want change. So it, it's just a hard road to go down, but um, we were trying to be a new museum in the 1980s and uh, period rooms wasn't part of that formula. So, um, okay. So Joe Snell, who was our executive director, worked with Ross Doyen in the Senate and was able to acquire $6 million to fund a new museum. And the question came up as, do we keep it downtown or do we move it where it is today? Um, and people are still, you know, have opinions of if we had stayed downtown, we were landlocked downtown um, and we wanted to do more outdoor programming. Um, I believe the solution came, um, I wasn't in on the discussion, but uh, Dale Carmine owned 80 acres where we sit now, where the museum sits now. And on those 80 acres was the building at the right, it, the Potawatomi Baptist Manual Labor School, which was built in 1848 and was used as a mission for the Potawatomi Indians until 1861. He was very concerned about having that building preserved. And that with the 80 acres, I think was the final, what helped make the final decision to move out here. And you can see on the left, uh, the restored mission. I should tell you at this point, Wanamaker was a dirt road. So we really were out of town. Um, this is my friend, Mark Hunt. He was the director of the museum and should be given credit for many of the wonderful things that were developed during that time. He's making a press announcement there um, and showing a picture of the new museum, uh, the architect's sketch. Um, you'll notice it's different than what our building looks like now because it was just the museum that moved out here in the 80s. It wasn't until the 90s that the rest of the agency uh, moved out and they got their own $6 million building. So here we are with groundbreaking. Somebody should look familiar there. That's a very young John Carlin. 
um, who was governor. Joe Snell is in the blue suit to his right. Um, and doing it in Kansas fashion, we broke ground with a horse and plow, and that's where I was doing in the back um, in the brown jacket. So while, okay, so here are some shots. Um, and these are all on Kansas memory now, thanks to the archives, they digitize these. And you can look at these at your leisure because everyone likes to look at an empty building <laughs> structure, but this is the construction of the museum. And you can see the Potawatomi mission in the far right corner. So while the building was building, being built, uh, Maureen Hart Hennessy was the assistant museum assistant move coordinator and I was a move coordinator. Now, if you want to really analyze this picture, we are on the second floor of the Memorial Building and you want to talk about age. Um, that's a pack of Merit Lights sitting between us. We smoked in the, in the conference room. You can actually smoke on the second floor. Um, we have both since quit. There's your, your ashtray over to the right. But we had to do a lot of planning. And one major, major objective we had, in addition to physically moving the collection, was to inventory everything. So earlier, about 1979, they, they decided to catalog the collection. And that's a whole other story. But let, it, let me just say that for, from 1875 to 1879, 1875 to 1979, they took really poor records of things. You know, people would cut, people would donate and the accession record would say blue dress and maybe a number would be put on the dress, maybe it wouldn't. So with 77,000 objects over a hundred years, uh, we kind of walked into a mess and the cataloging project, which was funded by the legislature, uh, we worked for about four years and got a quarter of the collection cataloged. Um, but we had uh, we had to move past that because we had to have uh, the collection, a record of everything before uh, we moved. And the reason for it was we had um, we had to have retrieval for everything um, and access to the collections after we pack them. So our first plan was to pack things like things together. Uh, so we grouped curatorial collections. Um, and at that point, we actually had three curators, which was wonderful. And they each had their own packing sheet color. I think that's blue, green, orange. Yeah, I think these slides have faded some, but um, so we packed each curatorial collection by what areas they had a jurisdiction over, whether it was uh, weapons or rifles or dresses or jewelry or whatever. Um, so here's an example. Um, when we pack the collection and like artifacts, uh, like artifacts in the same box, um, we used a system, it's called nomenclature, but it's based on, it's similar to the Linnaean system that biologists use for species, order, genus, that. Well, this had higher levels of, of a grouping. So like um, a teapot here in the picture is classified as a food service tools and equipment. And so we'd write it down on the packing form and then we'd put the type of material on the box. It was a code. I have to say we were worried about theft. Um, these things were sealed in there. You'll notice the up arrow, <laughs> no mistakes. Um, but we wanted to make sure that um, we were being as, uh, as careful as possible with this very valuable collection. And now remember this was before the days of computers. So we developed another system, this high-tech card system. So here is box 6564. And then we had headings. So where was box 6564 kept? Was it on the second floor, the first floor, what room? And that helped us maintain retrievability and accountability throughout the packing project. 
um, because at the same time, we were developing exhibits uh, for the new gallery. So people would say, I need to see that teapot. And you go, oh, okay, <laughs> we'll find it for you. Also, we were concerned once we put these boxes on the trucks, I mean, what if it went over the bridge or something? I mean, we had to have, we had to know where everything was at all times. So because most of our collection wasn't cataloged, we developed a, for, a system called Pack Inventory, which it just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? And our clerical staff was able to transfer the information from the packing forms onto inventory sheets and then file them. We generated 50,000 forms. And again, we're talking handwritten forms. Okay. So we would, uh, when we started packing, we asked the legislature for six people and we got three. You know, that's just kind of typical. That was, uh, we were supposed to start in January, 1983. Um, so they would pack in pairs. One would pack, one would write down. But after about four weeks of packing, we realized that at the current rate we were going, it would take 12 years. <laughs> at that point, it was 1995, which is history now. But in 1983, 1995 was not going to work. Um, so at that point, we had had seven interns also on staff who were doing the cataloging, three curators, and then three registration staff, including me. So everybody became a packer, and there were 16 of us. So here's a picture of one of those period rooms. This was the general store, and I think it took us a month of Sundays to pack that. There was more stuff in that thing. Um, so most of the exhibits were on the fourth floor. And here are John and Pam um, packing um, the period rooms. Um, and this is what it looked like when they packed things up. So you see the box number, you see a packing form on the side. Um, the best thing we did, we wrote the box number on all five sides because um, we ended up with a lot of boxes. Uh, deciding how to physically pack the collection required as much planning as the records. Um, and with the large variety of artifacts, everything from a campaign button to a cannon, we had to have policies and, and descriptions of how to pack everything. And we did have a conservator, I think two on staff then that really helped um, because we wanted to keep them safe. And we also had a lot of young staff who had come for six months to help with the project, young professionals, and they kept getting better jobs. And I think I hired a person a month through the whole, you know, so that was another reason for the manual. Although I had one, one person who will remain anonymous, Rick, who told me at the end of the project, he never read one of my memos. So it, it all worked out, okay? Um, so you can see how dense our storage was and why having the right uh, number on every side of the box was important so we could um, find things. And it ended up taking 13 months instead of six. Um, to get everything, to get everything packed. So um, in the end, we used 4,700 cardboard boxes. And you might notice these boxes aren't the pretty white acid-free boxes that museum things usually are packed in. We had $20,000 for the move, but that wasn't going to be enough for to buy acid free boxes. Also, we didn't really think we'd need them because we were going to unpack quickly. It took several years, but you know, so we made a lot of runs to the liquor store to get boxes and people brought them in. It was, it wasn't a pretty box set. Um, so since we were using acidic boxes, 
um, we thought uh, the best way to protect everything was to line the box with a polyethylene cleaners bag. So here you see every, every box was lined with a cleaners bag. And um, when there was extra space in the box, we used unprinted newsprint to keep things from moving around. And we used um, three tons of that um, to, pre to prevent very sensitive artifacts um, from it, during the packing. We did use acid-free tissue on them uh, like metal objects or textiles. And we ended up using 25,000 sheets of that. So we were constantly buying, hiring. Yeah. Um, we also used 10,000 Ziploc bags because we have a big collection. I wish I had a picture of all the buttons, campaign buttons, shirt buttons, um, military buttons. And you can imagine when you're packing, it could get stuck in the box. So we had to put everything in a Ziploc bag and write a tag with the number on it in the, in the Ziploc. So um, 10,000 Ziploc bags. Um, much of our packing material, um, our packing material budget actually went to a product called Jiffy Foam or Microfoam. It's an inert packing foam and you can kind of see it in the back, that white stuff that's wrapped around stuff. You'll see more of it uh, as we go along. Um, but that was really helpful um, for things that didn't fit in a box. Well, if they fit in the box and needed wrapping, but if they didn't fit in the box, like a chair, anything bigger than a chair didn't get in a box. And so it was wrapped with this uh, Jiffy Foam and we used, 130,000 feet of <laughs> Jiffy foam. Um, the dresses, um, we had 1,600 garments and we built our carpenter staff. Um, we had a wonderful staff, a big staff back then. They built these racks um, and we would put the garment on a padded hanger and um, put a cleaning bag over it. And then you can see hanging at the end of the rack is a packing slip. So that was one box. Um, this is the guy who didn't read my memo. <laughs> I hope he's watching tonight. Um, so some things were really big and large and they presented their own challenge. So I think if you've been out to the museum, you know, we have this wonderful 1914 longer and biplane. Well, that wasn't going out in one piece. So the conservator spent a long time dismantling the whole plane and boxing and creating the pieces. Uh, the other large odd objects that uh, weren't going to go out the front door um, and needed special attention. Um, you can see the great Smith to the right, the Longrens behind it. And Bob, he's a conservator, and are looking at a big wheel bike that also went out the roof. Um, so halfway, oh, there's our carpenter creating the great smith. So halfway through the project, we tackled the third floor storage area. And it had everything from painting. So this is the American woman and her political peers, a very famous painting, to buffalo heads. And this was the time before museums were really professional. And I remember standing in storage and looking at things saying, are those Christmas lights for the memorial building? Are they somebody's personal collection they're just storing here? Are they artifacts? I mean, it. Yeah, it was a real challenge. Um, so, and some of, so archives uh, or the, the third floor um, was um, annex. It wasn't the archives, the annex. The first floor was all publications for the library. So the second floor was covered in this really low quality <laughs> 
plywood that it's a good thing we weren't, I wasn't as big as I am now. I mean, it was just walking up there. I'm sure we broke every OSHA violation because there was all this stuff up there. And there's Maureen, who was the uh, assistant move coordinator uh, doing a yeoman's job. Here we are. Um, it was filthy. We were trying to see all the paintings in the back that we had to wrap up, the box up. Um, yeah, the plywood we did, as we moved along, we did put new plywood up at times because we didn't want to die. Um, and this is, um, we took a couple stage pictures along the way. So this was the packing crew in about 1983 um, in the annex. And this is my favorite picture of us because we had, the museum had, if it had one, it had a thousand picture frames because we had a donate, you know, people donated pictures of famous people. And sometimes the pictures weren't with them. We had so many picture frames. So there's there's the Motley crew. And then of course we get silly. And so we decided to pack one of the curators, Jim Kratzes, who did go on to be a uh, curator of the Jimmy Carter Museum. And then he was curator director of the Gerald Ford Presidential Library. I don't think they ever saw this picture of him. So now it's it's time for the move. And this is what the front of the museum looked like before we changed everything and moved the parking lot to the side. So capital moving, city moving and storage, it's an agent for beacons was low bidder. And we really lucked out because we had $100,000 and we were con uh, um, in our budget. We were really concerned that it was going to be much more than that. Um, Kay and her crew, um, they really wanted this job and they came in at low bid at just about $25,000 and they did an excellent job. Um, so Capital City moving in storage, if you're still in business, good job. Um, beginning December 8th, which is ironic because this today's December 9th. So 39 years ago, I was there, not here. Um, and we were moving collections into these vans uh, every Tuesday and Thursday, weather permitted. So by moving only two days a week, we felt like we could figure out what we were doing. Um, at the other end, because everything that got packed in the truck had to get unpacked at the other truck. Um, we, winter isn't the best time to move, but the building construction was delayed, so we did what we had to do. Um, every Tuesday and Thursday, we determined what would be would go on the truck, and it was moved into the lobby of the Memorial Building. Uh, because of the fragile condition of things, nothing could be stacked. So we had special decking uh, put into the trucks. And um, what could not be wrapped um, or boxed, we, we put blankets on. And here are the movers wrapping some things. They did a great job. Um, here's our elevator, which um, was, <laughs> it was the freight elevator. And when we moved the cannons, we would load the cannons into that elevator, push the button, get out of the elevator, run downstairs and hope they didn't end up in the basement because <laughs> it was old. We didn't want to crash with the cannons, but they all made it down safely. Um, one of the things also that we did, which most movers don't do is, there was somebody at the truck marking down the box number of every box that went in the truck. Then we locked the truck. Again, we're worried about things falling off bridges. When they got to the new museum, there was somebody there taking a number, taking the numbers off every box that came off. And at the end of the day, we compared them. This is, the artifacts don't belong to us, they belong to the state of Kansas. And this is the state's history. And so we are very serious about preserving these things forever. And we wanted to make sure 
we did the best in terms of security and uh, packing and moving. Um, okay. Here we are. Okay, so probably one of the most spectacular events um, of the whole move was we had to move the longer and biplane, these big heavy things. And so um, Capital City subcontracted to another company for $1,000 a day to use this super four or five story crane. And we were going to take these artifacts out of the skylights. Now, as a museum, the skylights were covered up because you don't want light on your artifacts. But if you go to the building now, which is um, houses the uh, Secretary of State and the Attorney General's office, they have opened up the skylights and they're just beautiful. Um, so that's how we got this stuff out. The cars we learned had been brought up the elevator shafts before everything was enclosed. The plane, I still don't know how the plane got in the building, um, but we had things like a stagecoach, a linotype, and a 4,000 pound jail. So they were too heavy or awkward um, to go down the stairs. And so we had to come up with another solution. So here we are moving. Um, that looks like a hose um, cart for a fire truck. And so the, the box would get loaded on the flatbed. So here we have two paper mache horses and we really debated not wrapping them and putting them in a horse trailer and just driving them through town, but that was against best practices. So here they all wrapped in uh, jiffy foam and blankets and they're making their way in that same crate um, out the skylight. And here's the great Smith that uh, Bob Cuevas uh, uh, created for us. And I do have to say the carpenter, I don't have a picture of Jack, maybe later on, but we were on top of the building watching this take place. And we said, what do you think would happen if that breaks? <laughs> we said, well, we won't have a job tomorrow, but <laughs> let's hope it doesn't. Now you can see, I think, oh, here's the jail coming out. So I love this picture of him. So this is the jail. It's really a, a drunk tank from Burlingame. And I wish we had a picture of it because when it was hanging there, a gust of wind hit it and there was a perfect silhouette in dust next to it. And then it just disappeared. And so here it is being loaded um, onto the flatbed to go to the new museum. Um, this, the, if you see the weather, uh, we were very fortunate. It was January 31st and February 1st of 1984, 34, um, and it was uh, 70 degrees. So we really lucked out. Um, 84 is 84, 70 degrees. Uh, we lucked out because in addition to having a thousand dollar crane and the flatbeds, we had to block off the street. So we had the city involved. We had the police involved. We had the media involved. So again, Jack and I are on the roof going, you know, if we, we mess up, <laughs> it's not going to be private. <laughs> It'll be all over the news, but luckily we didn't. Um, a couple other, um, so 73 items were craned out. A couple other uh, numbers. It took three and a half months and 41 van loads to complete moving the collection, 22,000 man hours. 94% of the collection was inventoried. At the end, we ran out of time and we had things we just had to put in a box. And my husband said, just write bathroom on it like you do at home and move it. <laughs> and we didn't, but we inventoried when it got there. Uh, so 99% of the artifacts were moved, 99.99 uh, .99, uh, were moved without any damage. I have to admit we did damage nine small artifacts like when a new packer picked up a teacup by the handle and then all they were holding was the handle. 
you don't pick it up that way. Nothing extremely valuable and only nine out of 77,000 isn't a bad record. Oh, and here we are at the other end. It was much easier to get the artifacts in the new building. Um, this is the Thomas Town Car. And here is our new storage area. So you can see the, the change between the building we're in and this state of the art um, with beautiful storage areas. Again, our whole goal here is to preserve the history of Kansas through its material culture forever. Um, this is a picture where I make the pitch that we're crowded. We've gone up to 120,000 objects and there were always plans that we would, grow, uh, we would have more storage area. And so hopefully someday that'll be true. Okay, one of the questions um, that I got when I worked here was how did we get the train in? And the answer is we built the building around it. So this Santa Fe locomotive that you're seeing here was used by the Santa Fe Railroad um, as a promotion material, as a, a promotion item, especially in 1819, excuse me, 1961 for the centennial of the state. They would take this steam engine and parallel it with the diesel engine and go around the state. So this um, steam engine um, was also in two episodes of Gunsmoke. Just another little interesting fact. Um, in order, so they had already said, if we got a new building, they'd give us the train. So it was the engine, the tender, and the two coaches, all dating back to 1880. So how do you move a uh, train into a museum? Well, you got to lay track. And so here, the Santa Fe Railway um, Company was very generous with their time. They gave us the train for free. They had their crew here laying the track and the ballast. And um, they had to do it in the winter. This was February of 82. The engine weighed 10 tons. So you can't, <laughs> you gotta have really frozen ground. So uh, in the morning, um, they loaded the, the coaches and the train engine onto flatbeds and took them from downtown out to the new museum. And I had the privilege of driving with a, a man named Bud Goble. And Bud Goble was a huge railroad collector and he had his own museum at Burlington, Burlington, Kansas. He had a depot and it was full and he gave it all to us. And we moved that into the new museum as well. So I was driving, Bud was enjoying it. Uh, we're moving along with the four tractor trailers and I run a red light because I was following the trailers and a cop pulls me over and he goes, lady, it's not a funeral. You got to stop at the red lights. <laughs> like, oops, sorry. So we made it there safely. And here's a great picture of the engine going over a bridge. And so these are the rough looking grounds of the new museum. You can see the mission in the background, the engine is still on the flatbed and they put, they pushed the two cars in and the tender and then the engine. So here's the engine literally being pushed in. It was quite the fun day. And then the wall was built around it. Um, and then before it was pushed in, here's a mug shot of the staff um, in 1982 um, who were there that day to witness it. Mark Hunt is kneeling in the foreground and I'm on the right with a really bad perm. It was the era of really bad perms. Um, one of the things that we weren't expecting was that day we got a call from the Santa Fe shops and they notified us that the Boiler was wrapped with asbestos. 
And so be wary when people give you a train, ask. <laughs> so this is the train in our gallery and they had um, started taking pieces off of it, but we had to uh, tent the whole train and hire people to remove the asbestos because we didn't want it in our new air handling system. So this is not the train you see today. It, it, it was a hard, you'll notice it has a different cab, a bigger tender, even the trucks are different um, because railroads call this rolling stock. And this was the most expensive and heavy duty engine in 1980. But as technology progressed, it was modified. The boiler was extended. There were all kinds of things done. So the decision was, do we keep that history or do we move it back to day one? when it came out of the Baldwin Locomotive uh, Works in Philadelphia. C C Cyrus K. Holliday, president of the ATNSF, bought 10 locomotives and tenders at $12,000 a piece. And at that time it was the most powerful engine. And it was actually used on the Rattan Pass to haul freight. Um, and what just gives me chills is they took a picture of one of the engines and sent it to Holiday, and it was the 132. That's our train. So here we have a picture. We knew exactly what it looked like when it came off um, the manufacturing, um, out of manufacturing. So we made the decision to turn it back to day one. And we hired Stan Mural, uh, Stan Mural, um, Stan Hurd to paint a mural at the front of the train of what Kansas looked like in 1880, the date of when the train was finished. And, and that is still there. And this is what, uh, well, before we close, what you would have seen, um, a very stellar, a beautiful uh, example of a freight engine, um, not a um, passenger engine. This is the height of Victorian era. So even freight engines had gilt and beautiful painting and detailings. A couple more pictures. This is what the 20,000 square foot museum gallery looked like before anything was done to it. I don't think it'll get that bare again. Uh, this was in the 80s and we started, we built all our exhibits in house at that time. And so here we are uh, constructing the Southern Cheyenne teepee. It was called a two woman teepee. They could put it up in 15 minutes. It took us three days in a genie boom, but we did it. <laughs> uh, some of you remember the Wichita Grass Lodge. We went out and cut the grass ourselves. And then uh, here is the Humbarger log cabin. Um, and it was from the Saline um, Valley. And uh, we took it apart and reconstructed it in the gallery. And then you can just see the top of the longer and biplane hanging there. So um, while the new exhibits will be different, um, I have told that some of these iconic artifacts will still be there. Um, and for sure the train is going nowhere. So with that, questions. Awesome. Get back over here. Get back on my <laughs> screen. I see a couple of questions have come in already. Um, but but we'll go ahead and get started with um, the first question is why did they move the museum from the memorial building in the first place? Um, it was, it had too many, it was crowded. Um, it was home to the whole historical societies and if every nook and cranny, every shelf, well, you saw the annex, there was no more room to put anything. And, uh, it, it things were being stored in shoe boxes. It wasn't state of the art. 
And this was also a time period when the whole field of museum studies was becoming professional. And so we knew we had to, if we were gonna preserve the artifacts, we needed new storage area and the exhibits were um, 40 years old, 50 years old, maybe a little older. Uh, kind of continuing with that. So then you mentioned this a little bit, but how did people respond to the change ultimately when you moved out here? A lot of people were really mad. And it was like, ooh. I mean, they wanted the period rooms um, and the period rooms were antiquated. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to tell the social history of our state. So when we did the gallery, we had themes like transportation, food, um, food ways, transportation, housing styles, things that people could relate to. And, and so we developed our story that way. And it was a chronological history of Kansas. At the Memorial Building, there were just little pockets of facts and artifacts. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they, but you know, people like to voice their opinion. That's good. <laughs> um, Maureen says, hi, Mary. Oh, Maureen, that was the um, assistant move coordinator. Oh. Who, uh, we smoked a lot of cigarettes and had a great time. And mm -hmm. I love you dearly. We saw your picture, Maureen. Well, Maureen says you should tell them about how, how the museum was supposed to close in January and the Senate president stopped us. That's true. I, I did, I cut that out because I was going a little <laughs> long. Um, so we had, we were going to go and if the fourth floor had all the exhibit cases and I mean, Maureen and I were in our bibbed overalls with a hammer in our hands to take things apart. And at eight o'clock in the morning we get a call and stop. <laughs> so I think it was how long, three or four months we had to pack the areas that weren't open to the public. All right. Um, Christine wants to know if we still have the 4,000 pound jail. Oh yeah, it's in storage and I hope it goes on exhibit. I know we're talking about it. Mm -hmm. So hopefully you can see that, um, get some good photos, have some good photos of it moving. So I believe I've heard a story about the airplane falling. Yeah, I wasn't director then. Bob <laughs> Keckeisen was the director and the long run biplane is very unusual. We're very fortunate to have it because it was Alvin K. Longren started building airplanes in Topeka in 1911. So the Wright brothers were 1903. So it's very early. There weren't flying schools. People built airplanes and flew them till they crashed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and our airplane has canvas covered wings and um, it has bicycle pedals you put your feet on in the front and um, and it had crashed several times. Um, and so Phil Billard, who bought the plane from Longren, unfortunately died in World War I as a test pilot. And his family kept the plane and gave it to us. So it's very rare. So we felt that we needed special care. No one on staff had ever hung an airplane before mm -hmm. from the ceiling. So we got the Smithsonian out here. And they are, they put bolts in the ceiling, four bolts, four metal rods, <laughs> one metal, <laughs> yeah, whatever, uh, steel rod, steel, yeah, it was steel, okay. yeah, what, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. um, it's not string, what's it called, <laughs> metal, <laughs> wire, thank you, that word escaped me, and so, we were building the gallery in sections and there was luckily none under, nothing underneath the plane at that time, but um, someone came into Bob Kekeisen's office who was director at the time and said the plane had fallen and he thought somebody was joking. Well, two of the bolts were faulty and they just stripped and here's the plane just swinging, didn't hit anything. Wow, not on my watch, oh, but right. <laughs> every everyone's nightmare and they came back and fixed it and it hasn't had a problem since. Thank goodness. Um, so speaking of artifacts, what was the most challenging artifact for you to move? Um, well, it wasn't for me, it was the conservator who had to take the long run apart, label mm -hmm. every nut, bolt, wire, everything. Um, that was a lot. 
But moving things that are big and awkward, even if it's just to put them into um, the bucket to move, but the linotype if in printing, we have a big printing collection because we were founded by newspaper men and a linotype is counterbalanced. And yeah, I had great fears it would fall and kill me. <laughs> yep, that would worry me too. Yeah. <laughs> and it's maybe one more question. Uh, and we still have time if people want to chime in with any additional, but how, what do you think of the whole process? What was the most challenging and the most rewarding uh, parts of the process for you? Um, challenging was trying to keep 16 people doing, following the, the pro procedures as we were developing them. Cause somebody, like when we found the furled uh, battle flags, um, I got a call and they said, because I said, just take them out of the tubes, wrap them with acid free, and we'll uh, worry about them at the other end. And they're like, Mary, they're just shreds. Mm -hmm. And so we were always finding things um, uh, that just, you know, needed a different kind of attention or we hadn't tackled it before. Um, and so that was challenging. It was rewarding too to work with a really neat group of people. Um, they taught me a lot about how to be a manager, that's for sure. I would do that. Holly asks, what is your favorite archive item? Hi, Holly. My favorite archive item. I do like the ballots from one of the territorial elections, the handwritten ballots for whether Kansas would be a slave or a free state. Mm -hmm. They're pretty cool. Um, there's just a lot. Um, and that's one of the things it, you, I've been with the museum and in the gallery for many, many years, but there's um, ways to display things that I hope in the new gallery will pop out. Like we have um, a slip, um, a handwritten sales slip for uh, an enslaved person mm -hmm. and it's really lost. And when it's a very powerful document, mm -hmm. when you look at that and you think, this is, this is not right for one thing, but, um, and so I hope we can make sure that the key artifacts um, that really are important to our history are highlighted and people can have that same sense of, wow. Mm -hmm. I agree. Well, that feels like a good note to start wrapping this up. And so first of all, just a big thank you to Mary for being here tonight. And it is very fitting as we are going through such a big change currently in the gallery to get to hear about the, the big change that happened 40 years ago. <laughs> 40 years. <laughs> amazing, time flies. Um, and just a, a change for our future museum after hours, we are going to be moving the date from the second Friday to the second Wednesday of every month, but still keeping the same time of 630. So just note that change for the new year in 2023. And hopefully we'll see you back here next month. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. And thanks, Mary. Happy